What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Fantasy Mafia podcast. I am your host, Jerry. I'm here alongside Jordan. What's going on, Jordan? It's been a while since we podcasted together. It has been a while. I'm ready to uh, rock and roll. We got this off season is in full swing. It seems like a lot of times in the NFL, the off season's a little boring, but uh, already early this off season, we're not even into March yet, and there's been a ton of moves. So this is going to be a really fun off season. I think by the end of it, I'm really interested to see how many new starting quarterbacks we have. Um, I know Adam Schefter on Sports Center one day said he thinks that there could be up to 20 teams that have new quarterbacks. I think that may be a little high, but it wouldn't be crazy that half the league could have a different opening day starter this year. So this is going to be a fun off season to track. Yeah, that's crazy how many – we already have a couple moves so far. There's a lot of high-profile wide receivers that are on the market, so I can't wait to start talking about them. Um, the league year hasn't officially started yet, but there have been a couple moves, like I mentioned. Let's just talk about those moves a little bit. We don't have to get too far in depth, especially because that's not our topic today. Um, but the first one affects your team. Uh, we saw Matt Stafford go from the Detroit Lions over to the Los Angeles Rams. Um, I feel and I think you feel that the uh, Rams are basically like a quarterback away from taking it to the next step, going back to the Super Bowl that they were there a couple of years ago. Jared Goff just wasn't that guy. Now, Stafford, obviously, being with the Lions, he hasn't really had the uh, the playoff prowess that that you want from a quarterback. But I think he could be that guy. So how what are your thoughts on this move? How excited are you? And um, just from like a fantasy standpoint, kind of break it down. I mean, I'm so committed to this move that I bought season tickets and I'm in New York. So that's how committed I am to this move. But no, I mean, focusing more on the fantasy aspect of it. I mean, I've said this and call me a little biased, but I think Matthew Stafford, just a little bit, a little bias, maybe bias. But I mean, I legitimately think Matthew Stafford has the upside to be the number one overall quarterback in fantasy. I'm not saying he's going to finish that way, but I think he has that kind of upside. I would put him in that top five range. Though. I really would. And I think one of the things that's going to hold him back is his rushing ability. Because when you talk about Josh Allen, Kyler Murray, Deshaun Watson, players like that, their rushing ability alone gives them a pretty high floor. And obviously Stafford's not going to have that. But I've talked about Jared Goff's fantasy value, uh, you know, in previous episodes we did last offseason and Jared Goff was a very underrated fantasy commodity in his three full seasons we're not counting last year because he was terrible but before that in 2017 he was QB 12 2018 QB 7 2019 QB 13 so he was a quarterback one almost every single season under Sean McVay and let's be honest Matthew Stafford is much more talented than Jared Goff that's just a reality so in this system I mean Matthew Stafford's a no doubt top 10 quarterback I expect him to go in that range, so he probably doesn't offer a ton of value. I'll be interested to see where his ADP falls as we start doing redraft leagues, but I really think his upside is tremendous. One of the things that I also think is promising is the Rams offensive line doesn't get a lot of credit, but pro football focus at the end of 2020 actually ranked them as the third best offensive line. So Stafford's never had this great of an offensive line. Cam Akers really came on at the end of last season. Stafford's had Calvin Johnson, but I don't know if he's had a collection or a duo like Cooper Cup in Robert Woods in his career. So when you put all those factors together, Matthew Stafford has all the makings to me of being a top five guy this year. So if you can grab him, you know, around QB 10, 11, 12 in drafts, I think he offers quite a bit of upside there. Yeah. And that's another thing. I'm glad you kind of went into the players too, because just thinking about it off the top of my head, I don't know the line. I don't know the contract status of the offensive line for the Rams, but all of the weapons, pretty much are coming back to the Rams or they're under contract, except for Gerald Everett. I believe he's hitting the market, but yep. um, the rest of them, Tyler Higby's there. Uh, you mentioned Robert Woods, Cooper cup. They just drafted, uh, um, you know, I can't remember his name. They drafted oh, a guy Jefferson. last year. Yeah. Van Jefferson. They drafted Van Jefferson. They got Josh Reynolds, Cam Akers. I don't know the running backs behind Cam Akers, but it seemed like he started to take over um, towards the end of the year anyway. So it really doesn't matter. I don't know if, uh, Dell Henderson is coming back or if he's a free agent or Malcolm Brown. Um, so just to break down the actual draft or the, the trade itself, it was obviously the, uh, the Rams get Matt Stafford and in return, the lions get Jared Goff. They get first round picks in 2022 and 2023. Obviously they didn't have a first round pick this year. They don't have a first round pick this year. Uh, they haven't had a first round pick since they, since they drafted Jared Goff. And then they get a third round pick this year. Um, and just all over social media, 
Twitter, Facebook, people are complaining about that this is a steal for the for the Lions. It's a crazy, crazy price overhaul for Matt Stafford. But I mean, and you can argue both ways, but part of that goes into taking on Jared Goff's contract. Part of it is because, like I said, the Rams haven't had a first round pick since since 2000. What was it, 15 when they drafted Jared Goff? So. So they, uh, it's not like they really had any success with any first round picks. They don't, it's not like they need them like the Patriots. They don't need them. Um, and then in return, Jared Goff gets a, uh, gets a change of scenery. He could be working without some of the weapons that are currently on the roster right now, though. Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, both are free agents this year. So, uh, any thoughts on, on Jared Goff this coming season, or we kind of want to wait until things fall into place there. Yeah. I mean, it's going to be a tough situation, not a great offensive line. The weapons are in flux. I don't really see any way that Marvin Jones or Kenny Galladay return. So, I mean, you could be looking at a situation where it's a, a rookie wide receiver and Quintez Cephas starting potentially. So, uh, I mean, Jared Goff really struggled last year. And I, I, that's one of the, the concerning things for me about Jared Goff from last season. I mean, I mentioned how good the Rams offensive line was plus a great system, and Jared Goff still wasn't successful last year. So that's very concerning to me moving forward. So, I mean, he's probably going to be, you know, around QB 22, 23, 24, 25, right in that range in fantasy drafts. And at this point, he's not a guy that I'd be touching because the Lions, uh, they should really struggle. I mean, they're going to be in contention, I think, for the number one overall pick. Yeah, that's without knowing who their weapons are. I mean, obviously, DeAndre Swift is going into his second year. TJ Hawkinson, this is his third year. That's usually when we start to see tight ends break out. So he could be a good uh, a good player to get in redraft this year. Mm -hmm. But we got to see who they're going to be, who who else Jared Goff is going to be thrown into, aside from the, the Vikings, the Packers, and the Bears in that division. Um, and then another trade that happened, another quarterback on the move, kind of affects two teams here now because uh, one quarterback that was a backup is now the starter. Well, actually, I guess you could say it either way, because towards the end of the year, the backup or the starter was the backup. Carson Wentz is going to Indianapolis for a 2021 third round pick and a conditional 2022 second round pick that could become a first round pick. I believe the um, the stipulations on that were Wentz has to play at least 75 percent of the snaps or 70 percent of the snaps and they have to make the playoffs. The Colts have to make the playoffs for it to become a first. So the worst case scenario is the second, probably looking at a at a lower towards the end of the towards the end of the second round pick because again like the rams the colts are in a really good position too um mm -hmm. to, to kind of go deep into the playoffs Fulk rivers got him there last year they got the defense to do it they got the offensive line a little less in the weapon department but um what do you you got anything to say about wentz and now the uh the permanent starter jalen hurts over in philadelphia yeah, I mean, I love Jalen Hurts. I've always loved Jalen Hurts. When we were doing some of our draft episodes last year, I said Jalen Hurts has the potential to be the best quarterback in this class. I don't think that's going to be the case because Justin Herbert had something to say about that. But, I mean, it still stands that I think Jalen Hurts has a lot of talent. He's a no-doubt top 10 dynasty asset at the quarterback position for me. And I know that's going to sound crazy, but with his rushing upside, uh, I, I think it's a pretty – he's an easy no-brainer top 10 guy for me. Um, I mean, I love the move for Carson Wentz. We knew that it wasn't going to work in Philly. That relationship turned kind of toxic. Even without Doug Peterson, it sounded like the relationship with management wasn't there. The offensive line wasn't great last season. And he's going to a perfect situation, you know. And we uh, talked a little bit about this before in our group chat. But Carson Wentz had a lot of success under Frank Wright in Philly. That's going back to his glory days. Was it 2017 when he had his big season? He would have won MVP that year if he didn't uh, tear his ACL against the Rams. He 100% was going on and on his way to winning an MVP award. So people forget that. So it's a chance for him to start fresh. A great situation with a great offensive line. You mentioned the defense. Their offensive line actually had quite a few injuries along their offensive line last year, and they were still ranked seventh in the league. So that says a lot about the talent that the Colts offensive line has. You know, I would expect them to go and grab another weapon for him. I mean, you have Michael Pittman, who's going to have to step up big time in year two. But, uh, you know, a few solid tight ends there. Jonathan Taylor really emerged. So they have a nice running game. So Carson Wentz, this is the perfect situation for him to turn his career around. And if he can't do it here in year one, 
I mean, he's probably we're never going to see Carson Wentz as a starting quarterback again in this league. And so far, two of his favorite guys, one of them is expected to be released already. That was Deshaun Jackson. So we could see him potentially go over to Indy. Um, I would imagine they'd probably want a different weapon. And then another one, Zach Ertz's name has been floating around too. That's been one of his favorite weapons for the last couple of years. Uh, he could be somebody that even though Indy does have a, a few good tight ends, maybe Ertz uh, heads over there to go play with his buddy Wentz and we'll see what happens there. But, and then, like I said, we, we got a Rob that's a free agent this year. Uh, Kenny Galladay, Chris Godwin. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's some, because the cap is supposed to go down or scheduled to go down. Um, we could definitely see some camp casualties. I'm actually going to be talking about somebody that uh, in our dynasty buys, somebody that could be the beneficiary of a camp casualty because of the cap. Um, and so I'll bring that up a little bit later, but that's so far on the off season. I mean, I think you're two for two. You got your, your, your favorite team got a quarterback uh, that's that could hopefully lead them to the promised land. And then you were the, I think you were the first one to mention Carson Wentz or predicting Carson Wentz going to Indy. So you're off to a good start this offseason. It's funny because 24 hours I was with my family and they weren't even talking about Stafford to the Rams. And I was saying that I would love to see Matthew Staff. That would be my ideal offseason with Stafford to the Rams. And then 24 hours he went there. So I was pretty excited. Awesome. And we get now after not having the Super Bowl be hosted by a, by the home team in forever, we had it for the first time this year and maybe see this for the second time next year when it's in back LA. To back. Yep. Exactly. Uh, let's move on to our main segment for today. It's dynasty buys. Um, I know you have a list of like seven, eight, nine. I got a list of, I don't know, 15 here. So we won't, we won't dive too deep into them. Uh, we'll kind of go over who our favorite dynasty buys are. Uh, maybe a couple reasons why um, this is the time of year where if you've checked out a fantasy, it's because you're only in redraft leagues. If you're still mm-hmm. listening to the podcast or, or checking in on your fantasy leagues, it's, it's for dynasty. Um, you're, so that's what we're going to kind of break down. I don't have any quarterbacks on my list. So to keep any kind of order here, why don't you kick us off with, with the quarterbacks that you have? Yeah, sure. So there's a few. If we did this episode a week ago, I would have said Carson Wentz because I really strong. I mean, you know, I've mentioned it several times in our group chat. I really thought he was going to go to Indy. I thought there was really no doubt. It just made too much sense with Rivers retiring and Frank Reich being there and them really needing a quarterback. Jacoby Brissett being a free agent. I mean, so it just all the cards and the stars were aligning for him to go there. So I would have said Carson Wentz. And I'll mention it as we go through this. I mean, I call it this time of year a temperature check to see what their value is for the current owner. So I would still check in to see if the current owner is all in on Carson Wentz and see where they value them. And not to mention, I mean, if Jacob, if you're in a deeper 2QB league, I would still take a look at Jacob Eason. Because like I said, if Carson Wentz doesn't perform, I don't know if he'll be there long term. So I'd still uh, snag Jacob Eason if you have a chance uh, on your bench. Um, But one of my favorites still is Jameis Winston. I've always been a Jameis Winston supporter. I fully expect him, if, even if he doesn't start with the Saints, if Drew Brees retires this season, I expect him to get an opportunity somewhere in the next two years. Maybe he goes to the Bears this offseason is another opportunity for him to start. But, uh, you know, if he does end up staying with the Saints, We've seen what that offense has done from a fantasy perspective. Drew Brees, even the last few years, hasn't been himself, but he's still been a top 10 guy. I would expect Jameis to step in and be a back-end QB1. And if you can buy him cheap right now, I mean, I think you definitely have to do that. So Jameis Winston's one of my favorites. I'm um, going to a, another buy low for me is Sam Darnold. We'd have no idea where Sam Darnold's going at this point or if he's staying with the Jets. But the reality is the situation's going to be better than it was with Adam Gase. I still think Sam Darnold does have some talent. If he goes elsewhere, I, I would consider that to be better for his fantasy value. But either way, I expect him to be a starting quarterback. And he's still only 23 years old. He's been in the league a few years, but he came in at a very young age. So he has the arm talent. He just needs to be put in a better situation. If you see him on the move to a team like Washington or the 49ers, I think that'd be a great situation for him. 
Both of them have, both of those organizations have great offensive lines. I think it'd be kind of interesting to see him with Kyle Shanahan in San Francisco. Not that that's been rumored or anything, but a team that may be looking for a change and a guy with a little more upside. So Sam Darnold is probably bottom of the barrel right now in terms of his value. So snag him. You can probably get him on the real cheap and uh, kind of see what happens, especially if you're hurting at the quarterback position in a super flex or two QB league. Then lastly, for me, uh, two rookies from last year, Jalen Hurts at this point, it's probably too late after Carson Wentz got traded. Like I said, I'm not the only one saying he's a top 10 dynasty asset right now. I've seen other guys say that on Twitter. But once again, it's more of a temperature check for me. If the current owner that has Jalen Hurts isn't a big fan of his and they don't believe in his long term potential and maybe he's trading them for a QB 15 value, or, you know, he, he has a wide receiver. You have a wide receiver that that owner really likes that you're not high on long-term. Maybe you can flip flop them. So, you know, I'd still reach out, see where they stand on Jalen hurts because not everybody's a Jalen hurts believer. And that's the reality. So I would at least check in and same with Tua. I mean, I think Tua is getting way too much criticism based on his rookie season. And don't get me wrong. I was not impressed with Tua. And I think there was a lot of concerning signs from him, especially how he threw under pressure. But you have to remember, he had really no reps after that hip injury (laughs) at Alabama with the shortened offseason, with no OTAs. I mean, he basically was just thrown into game action as a rookie after missing, you know, months and months after a pretty major hip surgery. So I'm not completely giving up on Tua. And honestly, based on his talent and his accuracy as a quarterback, I don't think you'll ever be able to buy him lower. I mean, a lot of people have already given up on Tua, and I'm not saying he's ever going to be that star that people think he could have been. But if you can get, you know, I you always sell high and buy low. I really don't think you're going to see Tua's value any lower than it is right now. And so I'm a big fan of buying him right now, even though I don't know if I'm 100% sold on him long term. If the owner's already given up on him and saying, yeah, you know, just throw something cheap my way. I mean, I'm 100% doing it at this point. Just uh, circling back with Tua and Sam Darnold, just a couple of things that I saw. Well, one thing I saw about Sam Darnold is NBC Sports tweeted that the Jets could be looking for, could be well, not really looking, but settle for a second-round pick now. So when everything was floating around with Deshaun Watson and before Stafford was moving and before uh, Carson Wentz got moved, I think the Jets were looking at a first-round pick. But they, they kind of just pumped the brakes a little bit, uh, might look at a second. So... I mean, there's probably more potential to see him be moved now. Um, so it just depends on where he goes. And then with Tua, uh, you bring up a couple of good points. And the thing I like the most about Tua is they, they're they set up, too. I mean, we, we saw them. They were pretty close to the playoffs last year. Um, really no thanks to Tua. I mean, Fitz came in and helped out a lot. That defense was amazing. Xavier Howard could have won the defensive player of the year. But um, they not only do they have uh, – they got a couple draft picks in the first round. Um, they got some cap space too, so they can go out and get those weapons. They could bring a Rob in, they could bring Galladay in, um, and that uh, anything that goes, anything that's behind that line or um, that's on the outside is definitely going to help out Tua. And then we also have your uh, your boy who's actually on my list, but I'll bring him up, Mike Gusecki, going into his third year. And as as I mentioned earlier, this is the year where the third year tight ends uh, tend to break out. So we could see guys like Noah Fant, Mike Gusecki, T.J. Hawkinson. Um, break out this year so that's just another weapon for Tua so I definitely agree with those guys Jameis I've I've always loved Jameis I'm I'm excited to see if he can start somewhere again in the league hopefully this year for the Saints Um, moving into the running backs I got a few here I know you got a couple I don't remember seeing any of the same so I'll go over my couple first Uh, the first one I got is it's kind of a combo I mean you don't have to you don't have to trade for them as a combo but Um, it it really all depends on who is, if either of them are the starter, uh, or if you can see him being the starter for the long term. but Chase Edmonds and Eno Benjamin out of Arizona, Kenyon Drake, he was on that, uh, what was it? The transition tag or whatever they call it (laughs) this past year. So technically he's going to be a free agent unless they re up him. Um, but he's going to cost quite a bit. Chase Edmonds. He wasn't, I mean, we've seen him in not in Cliff Kingsbury's office for, or offense for um for a few years, but we've seen him in the Arizona offense for a couple of years, and he, he I mean he really hasn't like had that breakout game, but he's shown that 
that he can be a, a steady starter in the league if he's given the chance. Plus the way that the offense in Arizona moves, a lot of it's through the air, a lot of it's on bootlegs with Kyler Murray. So it, it's maybe not an offense that you really you really want to target the running back. Um, but whoever is back there is going to have some opportunity for points because, I mean, they're going to be moving the ball a lot. And then the same thing goes with Eno Benjamin. He was the rookie last year. We don't really get to see a lot of him. But again, if Kenyon Drake doesn't come back, and with all these teams moving to running two running backs, even running cycling in three running backs, it's if you can get your hands on one of them, be a good be a good choice there. Um, Damian Harris is another one. I loved him this past year. Um, I mean, the offense really didn't do a lot at all. Uh, the whole New England Patriots offense kind of stunk, but he's a guy that I think that they they want to transition into i mean they don't have tom brady there anymore they want to transition transition into that uh that offense that can carry the rock and and throw when they have to and they kind of showed that last year with cam newton throwing what 10 10 passing touchdowns um obviously it didn't really help them out too much they didn't win a lot of games but damian harris i think that it, it's it's always hard to pick a new england running back um, but I think that he could be he could be the guy. I, I, I don't think they're going to be looking for anybody in the draft. Um, maybe they bring somebody in. But I think Damian Harris is talented enough to to lead the role there. Uh, Darrington Evans is another one. I mean, you you know, for a fact that I, I personally love this guy for I mean, since before last year when he was drafted. Don't now. The thing with him is he, he's behind arguably the best running back in the league and a guy that doesn't seem like he's ever going to go down. And he's probably still stiff airing people right now while, while we speak. But um, he's – the thing that you got to think about is Derrick Henry. It, he's touched the ball close to 800 times in two years, and that's including the playoffs. He doesn't, he doesn't get a lot of catches, so a lot of that is running out of the backfield. Um stretching out his arm, putting Josh Norman on his butt, other guys that he's stiff armed on <laughs> throughout the year. But um if if Derrick Henry goes down, now he did sign that big contract. I was more excited about him before the off season last year, uh when when Derrick Henry was still kind of on the fence with is he gonna sign, is he gonna test free agency, are they gonna tag him, what's going on? He didn't end up signing a four year deal. So uh that kind of drops Evans down a little bit. But if if Derrick Henry were to miss any kind of time, Evans is definitely a nice nice plug and play, and I don't think he would miss a beat. He's not as talented as Derrick Henry, but I think he could step in there and, and get the job done. Uh, Rashad Penny is another one. Chris Carson, I think there was a tweet out earlier this week or maybe late last week that said the Seahawks are, are not going to re-sign him, so he is going to hit the free agent market, which kind of opens up the backfield in Seattle. Rashad Penny, he's kind of been on the – kind of been on the sidelines since he got drafted he is a he's a former first round pick late first round i think he was drafted 27th 28th whatever um but he's uh if they don't bring chris carson back i think carlos hyde is also a free agent too so mm -hmm. as it stands right now rashad penny is, is one of the only running backs on the roster aside from some fourth and fifth string guys so if they don't bring either of those two back i'd imagine they'd out, go out and get somebody else but Rashad Penny would be the next guy up. And I, because of his injury history, he, he basically sat on IR for the past two years and wasn't really activated until the last final weeks of last year. Somebody might just be like, oh, I just completely forgot about this guy. I don't really need him. Go ahead, give me a third round pick for him or whatever it might be. So Rashad Penny is another one. I had Jeff Wilson and David Montgomery on my list. I don't want to get too much into him. I don't think David Montgomery is a buy low. He doesn't really fit the criteria here. He just the end of the year he was one of the better running backs helped a lot of people in the playoffs um he does still have those three easier run defense teams in his in his division to go up against so he's going to have some really good games and they don't really have any i mean Tariq cohen does come back i don't know if that's going to scare anybody away from david montgomery you could have gotten him for real cheap middle of the year last year i think his uh his price went up quite a bit so i'm not going to get too much into him and the same thing, Jeff Wilson, his uh, his stock went up. I think he just signed a um, – he re-upped with San Francisco not too long ago, too. Is that right? Yep. yep. So, yeah, I mean, who knows what's going on in their backfield there. But um, if, uh, if if Wilson is the guy, then he's definitely a uh, definitely a target for me because, I mean, San Francisco, they like to run the ball. Um, there's no better team at doing that than – I mean, besides Baltimore, than San Francisco. So it's uh, definitely a nice player to pick up there. 
Yeah, and I think my favorite from that short list is probably Chase Edmonds. He was on mine as well. I mean, Chase Edmonds looked better than Kenyon Drake last season when they were both healthy. And Chase Edmonds, I think, is more sized as a scat back. So I don't know if he'll necessarily take over that backfield. But, I mean, leagues are PPR leagues now. And, I mean, I think he's a back-end RB2 at the worst. So if you can buy him on the cheap, I think that's a nice option. I, I think Rashad Penny slash I threw DJ Dallas in there because he did get some reps and had a few decent fantasy games last yeah. season. Those are for me... I try to sneak guys like that into a trade, you know, so if you're kind of close with somebody, I'm like, oh, you know, just throw me DJ Dallas, you know, just as a throw in. That's one of my favorite moves is just, to, you know, realistically, that's a target of yours, but don't make it seem like that's your primary target. I mean, that's a trade strategy of mine is you don't want them sometimes to know that that throw in guy is a guy you're really interested in. So, you know, I try to make the primary focus. Chris Godwin will say, and if we're really close, say, eh, you know, if you throw in DJ Dallas, I'll do it. And then realistically, you just <laughs> got a guy that you really like as well and they don't really have any idea what you were actually doing and what your intentions were so that's something I like to do when I'm trading Um, and that's I think some of these guys are good candidates for that another one I'll throw in there another backfield tandem James Conner is a free agent I'm interested to see what Pittsburgh does I, Mike Tomlin really liked Benny Snell, and I thought Benny yeah. Snell actually looked really good when he had opportunities. He ran really hard, really aggressively, and it's kind of that gritty, hard no style that Mike Tomlin likes from his running back. So everybody talks about Anthony McFarlane, and I think that's a sexier name, but Benny Snell looked good. And as much as I think the Steelers could invest in a running back in the draft, and that's an important note to make here, some of these guys, we can talk about Rashad Penny, DJ Dallas, Benny Snell, but they could draft a running back and these guys could be completely irrelevant. That's why I'm more like targeting them as throw-ins in deals. Cause I mean, really would you lose at that point if you get them to just throw them in, in a deal. So Benny Snell's in that category for me as well, because realistically I could see the Steelers. They're the kind of team where if Mike Tomlin has this guy in Benny Snell, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't go out and grab somebody. So um, he's a really low end name few other quick ones, A.J. Dillon, who you have to mention him at least with Jamal Williams and Aaron Jones being free agents. I was impressed when A.J. Dillon got opportunities, and I made fun of him at the beginning of the year because we were talking about his thighs and how much of a beast <laughs> he was. But when he got carries at the end of the year, he looked really good. I kept calling yeah. him baby Derrick Henry, and I was half joking, but he looked really good. So he's the kind of guy, even if somebody really values him, I think that's the kind of guy I would pay back end RB2 value for him right now. And I think he could end up being a top 10 guy in the next few years. So as much as you may have to overpay a little bit based on his reps so far in his career, I think it really could be worth it long term. Um, Other quick names, Tony Pollard. I still I love Tony Pollard. And I'm probably in the minority here, but I legitimately think Tony Pollard looked more explosive than Zeke last season. I mean, when Tony Pollard touched the ball, he absolutely exploded. So I don't know if he'll ever get his opportunity in Dallas. He has, um, I think, one more year this year left with Dallas, and then he hits the free agent market. So this may be more of a long-term play, but it reminds me of back in the day Michael Turner was sitting behind LaDainian Tomlinson. And every time Michael Turner touched the ball, you're like, holy cow. And then he got his opportunity with Atlanta and really took advantage of it. Uh, I think Tony Pollard could do something similar to that if he's put in the right situation. So I I love Tony Pollard. Then the last one I'll throw in there. I don't think people are looking at him as a buy low candidate, but I personally am. And that's Clyde Edwards Hilaire. I mean, everybody kind of wrote him off after Le'Veon Bell came in. Because he was a top 10 guy before Le'Veon Bell came in. And then he was RB34 for the rest of the season once Bell came in. But, um, I mean, he looked good when he was starting before Le'Veon Bell was there. And they took him in the first round. I still think they're committed to him. And as crazy as it sounds, I mean, he was a top 10 dynasty running back last year. And now every dynasty rankings you're looking at, he's around RB15. And I saw him as low as 25. So once again, check to see what your own or the owner that has him is looking to get for him. You could argue when you think about all the successful rookie running backs last year, he might have the least amount of value 
and heading into the preseason last year, he had the most value. But when you think about Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift, J.K. Dobbins, Cam Akers, James, Rob James Robinson, Antonio Gibson, they probably all have more value right now than Clyde edwards helaire So when he's really fallen down that rookie depth chart there in terms of ranking them with those other guys. So I think he could actually be a, a buy low candidate because I've talked to a lot of people that have given up on him, but this is still a talented guy. I don't think long term any of those other guys on their roster, any of the Daryl Williams, Damian Williams, he's going to hit free agency, I believe now. Um, but I, Le'Veon Bell, I, who knows if he's going to return. But I think long-term, Clyde edwards helaire is still the guy. And if you can buy him on the cheap, I'd do it. Yep, for sure. Um, moving on to the wide receivers, I have I have a nice handful here. I uh, won't get too far into them. But, so the guy that I was talking about earlier um, with, uh, with Detroit possibly looking for a wide receiver is with the cap space, Buffalo could be, Buffalo could be getting rid of John Brown. Um, I think they save eight million if they do if they do get rid of him without too much of a dead cap hit. Um, so Gabriel Davis is a guy that he's in his rookie year last year. He had seven touchdowns. He, I mean, obviously Stephon Diggs was the favorite target. Cole Beasley in the slot was was the was the next favorite target. But Gabriel Davis was the guy that Josh Allen liked to hit deep, uh, liked to hit him in the end zone a lot. He was targeted. He's, I mean, he's had. Quite a few. I mean, I remember a couple of games where he just had some sideline toe taps in the playoffs, and I'm pretty sure everybody saw um, just Gabriel how Gabriel Davis showed out. He didn't. I mean, he just he was a guy that I think that if they don't bring anybody in and they do end up getting rid of John Brown because they do have some guys. I mean, they got uh, Isaiah McKenzie and Andre Roberts who are set to hit free agency too. Could be losing John Brown, so I'd imagine like other wide receivers are going to come in here. Um, but Gabriel Davis could be lined up on the other side of Stefan Diggs next year uh, in week one with, with Cole Beasley in the slot. So uh, that's a guy that I really like uh, for long term. Um, Will Fuller is another one. He's uh, obviously he had he pretty much had his breakout year last year until he got hit with the PEDs. And I mean, there's a lot of speculation going on that PEDs are the reason why he stayed healthy and why he had the kind of year that he did. And then maybe so. Um, he still has a game left on his suspension. So going into redress, people might be staying away from him or going into the season in a dynasty. People are like, well, he's still facing a suspension. Maybe, I mean, a lot of dynasty players are are smarter than, than, than you think, but somebody could look at it and see, oh, he's suspended. I don't know if I want to deal with that. Or if he gets suspended again, I don't want to deal with that. So maybe you could buy him real cheap. Um, and we've seen what he can do. Now, was it the, was it the drugs? I don't know, but if it wasn't and Will Fuller has that kind of year again, then, I mean, he was a first round pick uh, back uh, for Houston. So he definitely had the talent coming out of college. Um, so we'll see where he goes. He's also a free agent too. Yeah. So we got to see where he lands. Uh, Colin Johnson. I just absolutely love this kid. Um, I mean, if you're Trevor Lawrence is all but written in as the number one overall pick to the Jacksonville Jaguars, they do have DJ Chark and LaVisca Chanel there. But um, if you're if you're a big Lawrence fan, you're probably going to want to get your hands on on any kind of weapons that you can from the Jacksonville Jaguars. And Colin Johnson is one of them. He he saw some playing time last year with uh, with Gardner Minshew and with um, I don't remember who the other quarterback's name was. Wow, Jake Luton. Yeah, that guy. Um, he saw so he saw some playing time uh, there, and and he's. He's a big body receiver, big end zone threat. They don't really have that that top end tight end, so somebody that they could that they could hit in the back of the end zone. Colin Johnson, Quintez Cephas. We brought his name up earlier, so I won't get too far into him. He's a guy that Kenny Galladay and Marvin Jones. They might not be back in Detroit. This he essentially could be the number one receiver for Jared Goff in Detroit. And then uh, Tyler Johnson, another uh, rookie last year. Um, with the Tampa Bay Bucks, we already mentioned how, or we didn't mention how Chris Godwin was going to be a free agent, but Chris Godwin might hit the open market, and um, Antonio Brown's a free agent, Rob Gronkowski's a free agent, so Tyler Johnson could be lining up there in the slot. We all know how Tom Brady likes the slot wide receivers. And the last one I had was, actually I had two more, I don't really have a lot of uh, a lot to say about the last one, but first one, Michael Gallup, and we brought this up when we did our draft show, after the Cowboys drafted CeeDee Lamb, that we could very well see Michael Gallup be looking for a new team. I think it was after this season, his yep. contract is up. 
So go get him. Um, I mean, he's still in that three-headed monster out there in Dallas and even four-headed monster because there's a guy in the tight end slot that I want to bring up when we get to tight ends. But so he's a guy that uh, in that three-headed wide receiver monster, they could uh, he could be on the move next year, could maybe be the number two, number one somewhere. Um, and we've seen what he can do with, with guys like Andy Dalton. We've seen what he could do with Dak. And then the last guy is Calvin Harmon. Kind of uh, his season was written off with injury. But Washington, they're looking for weapons. They're not too many pieces away from competing. We saw them in the playoffs this past year. That defense can compete with some of the best teams. Um, they get the right quarterback. They just re up Tyler Heineke. And they got uh, they got uh, Terry McLaurin on the other side. I think Calvin Harmon, big body guy, he can be a guy that, that sees the field a lot more in uh, 2021. Yeah, that's actually an interesting point, and that's one of the reasons I mentioned Logan Thomas a few times this offseason, but I, that's a, I, I'm interested to see what Washington does with the receiving core. I mean, we, Sims uh, had a few big games for him at the end of last season, too, so it'll be interesting to watch that through camp to see who wins the number two job there. I had a few of those guys that you had on your list as well. I just want to mention them briefly. Will Fuller, I'm interested to see where he goes, but the thing with a lot of people that own Will Fuller is they're kind of over him at this point between the injuries and then he was in the middle of a wide receiver one season and then the PED suspension. So he's probably a guy you can get pretty cheap just because they're sick of his crap at this point. You want to rely on Will Fuller, but you just haven't been able to. And I mean, he averaged the seventh most points per game, fantasy points per game while he was on the field last year. So he was a top 10 guy, very consistently had a huge season. So that's a guy we talked about Miami maybe needing a weapon. I'd be kind of intrigued. Uh, He'd be the number one guy there. And uh, I think he'll probably get an opportunity somewhere to have a lot of targets. So, um, and Quintez Cephas is the other one I really like. This is insane, but Quintez Cephas could be the Lions number one wide receiver next season. Now Hawkinson will probably be the primary weapon, but I mean, Quintez Cephas could be their number one wide receiver. I mean, that's how even Danny Amendola is a free agent for him. So he could legitimately be the last man standing. And, you know, obviously they'll bring somebody in, but Cephas has a good chance to start. And at this point, I mean, he you can get him for probably nothing. I mean, I picked him up on the waiver wire at the end of last season in a lot of leagues just as a speculative ad, but... I like him quite a bit. Um, Other names I have, the first one I'll say, because he doesn't kind of fit into what we have been talking about, but I did throw Chase Claypool in there. Number one, we don't know the future of Juju in Pittsburgh, but I really believe Chase Claypool and his ability is kind of DK Metcalf-like. He has that size and that body and that ability. So right now, Claypool, you may be able to get him at a wide receiver two value. But I really believe that next season he could launch himself and have that kind of trajectory that we've seen other second year wide receivers take. So it might not seem cheap now what his price is, but compared to what he could be in the future, I do think it's decent value. If you're looking, the rest of the guys I have on this list are more buy low. Um, Some of my favorites... These two guys, I like looking at the end uh, rookies more specifically. I like seeing how they did towards the end of the season and trying to catch guys that really started to improve. Two of those guys for me, one was Darnell Mooney. He was actually a lot better than people uh, gave him credit for. He had 63 receptions last year. I don't think a lot of people realize that and over 600 yards. That's a pretty solid rookie season. And with Allen Robinson being a free agent, I think Darnell Mooney could be a really sneaky wide receiver too next year. Over the last four games, he was wide receiver 25 in PPR league. So he was very sneakily a nice option, at least as a flex play over the last four games of the season. So I really like him. Same with LaVisca Chenault. You mentioned uh, Colin Johnson, but I really liked uh, Chenault's ability, and Trevor Lawrence is only going to bring all their wide receivers' values up. Chenault was wide receiver 20 over the last four games. So once again, he looked very good. He improved. And when he was healthy, he actually was a very reliable weapon for the Jags. Um, So I I like Chenault. I think he has some wide receiver to back-end wide receiver to upside I uh, mentioned Michael Pittman earlier. T.Y. Hilton's probably not going to be returning with Indy. They have Carson Wentz there now. Michael Pittman's going to have to be the number one wide receiver. He was a, a little underwhelming compared to what you and I, I think expected out of him last year. I really liked Michael Pittman specifically. I thought he had the upside to be one of the best receivers in this class. 
only had 500 yards over 13 games, but, um, you know, he dealt with an injury early in the season. I think he struggled to get acclimated after not really being able to practice much. So once again, I'll give him a little bit of a pass because considering he didn't get to practice that much, he looked pretty good in his limited uh, opportunity. So I, I still like Michael Pittman. Uh, then the last two, Denzel Mims. We'll see who's starting at quarterback for the Jets last year, but he had 45 targets in nine games, not too shabby. That's an 80 target pace for a 16 game season. So, uh, you know, it depends who they bring in, but you could be looking at him as the wide receiver too in New York next season, if they do bring in another target, but could, you could see him get 90 targets or so next year. And uh, really he's cheap right now. And then the last one is Henry Ruggs. I was very big on Henry Ruggs heading into the draft. I have not given up on him after one season. Tyrell Williams, who didn't play last season, really, it's not going to be there again. Um, but one of the reasons I just I really believe in his skill set still. And when you look at him, I still think he's Tyreek Hill like. And when you look at Tyreek Hill's rookie season, he only averaged 37 yards per game. Henry Ruggs averaged 35. So, I mean, they were right there. So, I, Henry Ruggs doesn't have Patrick Mahomes, and that may be a little bit of a difference. But uh, I still think that Henry Ruggs has all the ability in the world. I think they're going to try to work him into that offense more. He was number one in target separation last year, meaning he was getting uh, running pretty clean routes and getting open. Uh, and funny enough, in 2019, Deontay Johnson was the leader, and that's why he was one of my breakout candidates. Because, yeah, I mean, that's – a wide receiver's job is to get open, and that's one of those metrics that sh displays that. So it's one of those that I like to look at for potential breakout candidates. And Henry Ruggs actually led the entire league in target separation last year. So, um, you know, if Derek Carr can get him the ball more consistently, I think that he'll be a pretty nice buy low candidate. And this is a guy that was a top 10 pick in a lot of dynasty rookie drafts last year. And you might be able to throw a second round rookie pick this year and get Henry Ruggs and get him. Honestly, I would do that. I would take the chance on Henry Ruggs rather than making that pick at this point, just because I like his upside that much. Yeah. And they're uh, the Raiders leading receiver, not named Darren Waller is also a free agent this year too. So yep. uh, we'll see what happens in that wide receiver room. We, they got, I mean, we got a bunch of guys that are um, not really a bunch of guys, but a, a couple of guys from the Raiders that, that were a little higher on Henry Ruggs, Brian Edwards, uh, Darren Waller is also one of those guys there every year. He's going to be a, a top commodity. So um, let's see if they can put it all together. Our final position that we got is tight end. Sorry, Jordan, we're not talking about kickers today. Um, <laughs> uh, I got a couple here. Again, I mean, tight ends are very, very hard to predict. It's it's a, a year from now, two years from now, even week to week, it's very hard to predict. I mean, there was weeks where one catch for – one catch for a one yard touchdown was a, was a top 12 tight end. And yeah. that's just how crazy it is. So, um, but if you have a tight end position, which most leagues do, you got to play one. Uh, you just take the upside. If you, I mean, in dynasty leagues, most of the guys that you're going to be playing are already on rosters. So you, you kind of got to put your three or four tight ends that you want um, on your bench and, and play the best one. But a couple of guys that I do like for this year and the future uh, is actually the first one is one of your guys, Mike Gusecki. We already talked a little bit about him when we talked about Tua um, going into that third year. He's a guy that uh, could be. I hate to use the word, but I bring we say it pretty much every every time that we talk about tight end safety blanket for a young quarterback. Tua, um, they did show a little bit of connection. Well, they showed a little bit of connection. He showed some connection with Ryan Fitzpatrick too last year. So it, it's hard to say if that chemistry is really there with him and Tua. But Gusecki, he is arguably the the most talented pass catcher on that team, um, next to Devontae Parker. Another guy who well, let me say something before about Mike Gesicki so we don't have to go back to him quick. People made fun of me several times because I said he was going to be a top five tight end. And just for the record, I want to say he finished as tight end seven this season. Oh, so I was not that far <laughs> off. But I mean, that just goes to your point at how volatile the position was, because Mike Gesicki, everybody was like, oh, he was so underwhelming. And he was the seventh best fantasy tight end last season. And he had some huge, I mean, he had a four or five game stretch where he was horrendous and he still was the seventh best fantasy tight end. So, I mean, it's been a, I thought that it was a really deep position last year. It did not turn out to be that way, but 
it's a it's a, the toughest position in fantasy right now because wide receivers so deep i think there's a lot of young running backs up and coming tight ends it's it's tough yeah i mean that just goes to my point where you just how bad the tight end position was this year uh, a guy that kind of got pushed off to the side because of their signing and then we also saw the rookie come in this year and do a little bit of work uh david and joku He's a guy, I mean, we there was trade speculation last year, especially when Austin Hooper signed. He, he, I don't know if it actually came from his mouth, but there's been rumors that he said that he wanted out. Um, I mean, he's still a Cleveland Brown, but he's a guy that he can be a starter on, on most of the teams in this league or the teams that do use two tight end sets. Um, he'd be a pretty solid, pretty solid tight end. He has had some injury history, um, but he is a, he's still on the younger side. He's we saw what he could do as a tight end one um, with Cleveland. And I, I think that he, he definitely deserves a shot to if it's on the other side of Hooper. Fine. If it's with somebody else, he gets he gets his trade wish. That's fine, too. I just think that he's a guy that if he if he gets his chance, he could be he could be up in that tier two, tier three of tight ends, uh, which doesn't really say much. I mean, after Kelsey and, and Waller and. Mark Andrews, you're you're pretty much like just throwing a dart, and and Joku could be maybe the top of that list um, if he's given the if he's given the opportunity. Irv Smith is another one with the Minnesota Vikings. He's uh, he's gradually transitioning to their 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 top priority tight end, Kyle Rudolph. He could actually be on his way out this year, whether it's via trade or they just release him for for uh, salary cap. Um, we saw him have a couple big games. We saw him have uh, really small games. With I mean, that was just the position this year. You can't, like I said, you can't really predict the tight end position, but he did. He he won you some weeks too. He had a he had a couple, yeah, at least one two touchdown week. I don't know if he had another one, but he did have some big weeks um, in there. And he's definitely a guy where he's uh, he could be a, a big target in this Minnesota offense, especially with how Justin Jefferson emerged going to have to throw another guy on him. Adam Thielen is still there. Um, Irv Smith was looked at in the, in the red zone a lot. So that's a guy that uh, go out and get Blake Jarwin was, uh, was the other one uh, part of that four headed monster in Dallas that I was talking about. He was, um, he was out all year. He injured his, uh, I think he tore his ACL in camp or it was Achilles, one of the two, but he, um, yeah, I mean, they had Dalton Schultz come in. And he had a pretty solid year, but Blake Jarwin, I think, is the guy. He's the he's the number one there. Uh, our own guy, Blake, is a big fan of him. Um, he has a, a Harry Potter length novel about him. I don't know if you want to go read. If you got some time, go read that. But Jarwin, when Dak Prescott is back, and if Michael Gallup ships out, so we could be seeing this next year in uh, 2022. Um, Jarwin could be one of those guys that are towards the top of the tight end list. And then the final one that I got is Dallas Goddard, especially with all the news about uh, Zach Ertz possibly on his way out. Goddard has been slowly transitioning into the tight end one there. The only thing that kind of brings him down is uh, Hertz really wasn't looking his way too much when Hertz played those four games that he played. Um, so who knows what, especially because Hertz can run too. So when they get into the uh, red zone and goal to go situations, is Hertz going to just tuck it and run into the end zone? Is he going to be looking for Dallas Goddard? Kind of takes away some touchdown upside there. But if Hertz is gone, Dallas Goddard is is the next guy up, and, and they drafted him pretty high for a reason. Yeah, Dallas Goddard was the one that I wanted to highlight, actually, as well. Um, I mean, I was a big fan of his heading into last season. He was being drafted as, like, tight end 18, something crazy like that. And he was a top 10 tight end in 2019. 2020, he dealt with some injuries. But on a point-per-game basis, he was still 10th overall. And people still don't treat him like a tight end one. And I think his value is only going up, like you said, with Zach Ertz most likely on his way out. Especially with Eagles having a ton of dead cap with the Carson Wentz deal. Uh, they're taking 
$35 million dead cap hit this year, which is the most in NFL history in a single season for one player. They're going to have to save some money where they can just to field the serviceable roster. And Dallas Goddard actually got a lot more looks than people give him credit for with Jalen Hurts. In those four games that he played with him, he had seven, six, eight, and three targets. So, I mean, nothing outstanding, but 24 targets in four games, so six targets a game. That's a 96 target pace for an entire season. I mean, that's pretty solid. That would have put him in the top 10 among all tight ends. So, I mean, I think he's a guy that's going to be a, a top tight end. He should be drafted as one, but he won't be. That's just the reality is he's one of those names that people don't view as a top 10 tight end. And when you look at their weapons, I mean, what other threats do they really have at this point? I mean, Jalen Rieger is going to be going into year two. He's another guy that could be a buy low candidate as well, actually. But they don't have a ton of weapons. Um, so I uh, I like Dallas Goddard quite a bit. And he was the only tight end that I wanted to throw in there. You could put some of those rookies if you wanted to. Adam Troutman may get more of an opportunity this year. Uh, with Jared Cook probably not in New Orleans next season. Cole Komet had a few games last year where he emerged, but Jimmy Graham's there one more season. Um, but once again, if Allen Robinson's a free agent, there's gonna there's a lot of targets that are going to free up in Chicago. Yep. When you talk about vacated targets, there's going to be a ton in Chicago with Allen Robinson gone. So you may see Cole Komet come in under the radar as well. So those are uh, three names that I would just – throw in there all right um do we i mean do we skip anybody you kind of went back to jalen rieger and the wide receivers i, I can't really think of anybody else i mean you brought up cole Komet and adam troutman those kind of, those two names kind of uh slipped off the top of my tongue when 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 you were talking about goddard so but i mean we've had these lists together for maybe about a week now um and i mean there's there's plenty of guys we, there's a lot of off-season movement that we got to see too it's mm-hmm. it, who knows i mean zach Ertz could be lining up for philly in week one and, and these are dynasty uh dynasty by lows too so it's not saying oh don't be mad if you went out and traded for dallas goddard and find out zach Ertz is still there it might not help you next year it might not help you at the beginning of next year but in the long run it's going to be a good move because goddard should be the future there um so just don't if if you're watching this, don't take any of these guys and then expect them all to be 2021 20, guys. And that's it. This is for beyond 2021. 20, and that's why I like approaching it, especially these buy low guys, if you can get them as a throw in, because at that point you really didn't lose much. And Dallas Goddard's actually a pretty good example, because at this point he probably would be a throw in for most people. And if you don't really have a long term answer at tight end in your dynasty league, I mean, that's a perfect opportunity. You may be getting a top 10 guy and, you know, not guaranteed. And actually, I still think he has top 10 upside, even if Zach Ertz is there. And that's usually a pretty uh, two tight end heavy set. We'll see how that changes with a new offensive system. But um, Nick Sirini was in Indy before, and they've been known for using their tight ends as well. So that may not change as much as people are anticipating. So, um, yeah, I mean, I still Dallas Goddard was a top 10 tight end, even when Zach Ertz on the field in 2019. So I still like his upside either way, honestly. So if you can get him and I know a lot of people don't have an answer at the tight end position right now, because there's not very many good ones. So I think Dallas Goddard is the perfect guy to go after in that scenario. And all the tight ends kind of blend together, but I believe Goddard was actually one that I got on the waivers in a dynasty league for free. Like, why would you drop him? I don't know in a dynasty league, but I think he, I think he was the tight end that I got. Um, it, it's crazy. Like, so that's another thing. I mean, if you're like right now is a time, I mean, maybe a lot of your league has checked out and they're not, and they're making moves. So you're not going to find good players, but check your waivers, continue to check them every couple of days or whatever. See, I mean, if you're, if you're on sleeper, especially they, they send notifications when there's a roster move made, if you do, if you have them turned on. So anytime somebody does anything, updates their nickname, put the tra- puts a player on the trade block or drops a player or trades for a player, you'll get that notification, go in and see who it is and, and see if it's a guy that you're looking at. Um, and especially like if if it's this time of year where maybe seven other league members are not going to be doing that, you and three other guys might be fighting for that guy with waiver priority instead of everybody fighting for that guy. So go see who it is. Check your roster. Um, these are the little things that you get these guys for free. Like I just joined a dynasty league a couple weeks ago, took over a new league. I've already made some trades, but there was a bunch of guys that 
like just a bunch of wide receiver twos and threes and, and some running back threes that, that could potentially move up to twos that I just threw a bunch of zero dollar bids at them and I got them. And like the, the benches are so deep and, and I got rid of some players that I'm, I'm never going to use. So I just threw out some waiver wire bids and I got them and, and just trying to build my roster before we even get into the draft. So um, definitely check out those things. Uh, I don't know if there's, notifications on flea flicker or anything like that that's another bigger dynasty platform so if there is then then turn them on especially during the off season just so you can uh, kind of get ahead of the game any other any other tips before we sign out no i mean i think that's good i mean some of these names that we've mentioned uh, may be free agents right now in leagues <laughs> i mean i picked up quintess cephas in almost every single dynasty league i swear at the end of last season that i was in and I mean, if you're in a league where maybe it's not as deep or people don't pay attention like that, uh, you know, he may still be available. I mean, I would just go through the depth chart quickly. I mean, you can go on our lads and they have every single team's depth chart on one page. And I would just scroll through quickly because, I mean, a team like Atlanta, for example, with Todd Gurley not returning there, we don't know exactly who their running back's going to be next season. But if you think there's a chance that Ito Smith may be the guy, I mean, Adam, especially if you just have a guy with maybe you were carrying two defenses or you had an extra kicker because of a bye week, something like that, or somebody that's going to be completely irrelevant next season, I would just do a quick depth chart scan. And if you see, oh, you know, the future of the Falcons backfield is in flux right now, you know, pick a guy up. Is Ito Smith going to be their starter next year? Probably not. But what if he is and you just got him for free? I mean, we can say they're probably going to draft somebody and, I, you know, they're a good candidate to draft Najee Harris or ETN or one of the top running backs, but their defense also stinks and they need to address <laughs> that as well. So is running back their top priority? Maybe not. So maybe you see a guy like that uh, break through and end up getting more carries than we think. So I, I think that's the other thing I would do is just do a quick depth chart scan. All right, so that's going to do it for us. Uh, stick with us this offseason. We're going to be here, try to get out a couple pods a week, at least one a week. Um, we're going to do a sell high episode, kind of the opposite of this show. We're going to get into rookies. Uh, we're going to, I mean, it's not just all going to be dynasty stuff. We're going to get into some redraft stuff too. Uh, we'll predict where some, where we think some players are going to go. And then as players do sign or get traded, we'll talk about what, how that affects the players around them. Uh, I'm glad you actually brought up Atlanta because I think that Najee Harris is a perfect fit for them. Mm -hmm. And especially because the uh, offensive coordinator from Tennessee is now their head coach. Mm -hmm. And Najee Harris is really, he's only like one or two inches smaller than, than Henry and maybe about eight pounds lighter than Henry, but he's like a mini Derrick Henry. And if they can, if, if he could bring his philosophies, the rushing philosophies over from the Tennessee Titans to the Atlanta Falcons, and they go out and get Najee Harris, their version of Derrick Henry, I think that could be huge. So I don't know. I mean, I think they pick in, in the top 16 um, or they're right around that 16. So I don't know if, if that's where they want to pick a guy like Najee Harris. Maybe they could trade back and grab him. But if Atlanta gets their hands on Najee Harris, and we'll talk about that more when we get into our rookies and, and the draft shows, but just a little sneak peek. If Atlanta gets their hands on Najee Harris, I think he could be like a Derrick Henry 2.0. Mm -hmm. uh, so with all that, we'll get out of here, and uh, next week we'll we'll do your uh, sell highs for your dynasties so we could so we could get some offseason trades this, this offseason. So uh, for Jerry and Jordan, this is the Fantasy Mafia, and we'll see you guys next week. Peace.